Hello and welcome to the Final Frontiersman, a YouTube channel about all things Star Trek with a heavy focus on the Star Trek Adventures role-playing game by Modifius Games. This is going to be one of those episodes as I review another product from the Star Trek Adventures line. Uh, as with most of our videos, especially the reviews, we are going to use our alert system. So you may see that pop up. Uh, yellow alerts for things that are interesting. Red alerts for things that are great. And the rarely used black alerts for things that are groundbreaking. So some things I have thought ahead of time I'm going to give an alert to. But uh, often I come up on the spot deciding that things deserve an alert so that's what the system is anyhow we're going to jump right into it so this is going to be a review about the guide it was released i believe a year ago not entirely sure it's the shackleton expanse campaign guide which uh, the shackleton expanse is the original unique setting um, so far, only available or only found in the Star Trek Adventures role-playing game. Um, Paramount signed off on this. So this is a unique area of space that is um, currently, um, hopefully changing in the future, but currently only found in the Star Trek Adventures game. So going to uh, get into it as usual for these reviews. I'm going to hop down into the little corner down there and show um hopefully um some nice pictures up there and there's beautiful pictures in the book so i have plenty to choose from but hopefully it's something that i'm talking about so uh let me just um go over right away first of all uh i'm really late on doing the review at shackleton expanse and i've done reviews for books that came after it and i think um the reason is uh, is well there's a couple reasons but really Star Trek Adventures Modifius they have been hitting home run after home run with these books that the Shackleton Expanse this book was a huge release don't get me wrong th this was a big major release and the book itself is huge it's roughly the same size as the core rule book and fans were clamoring for it. They were waiting for it. I was excited for it. I was so thrilled when I got my hands on it. But it got easily, and I don't want to use the wrong word, but it got overshadowed by the next release and the next release and the next release. And it's not that the next releases and all the new stuff, um, especially the exquisite Utopia Planitia, it's not that it's better. It's just that... Everything is so good that's coming out that you're just moving from one to the next. Like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, just keeps getting better and better. Uh, so I think because of that, uh, my focus on the Shackleton Expanse kind of um, drifted away because I was going to read the next book. And while I was preparing for this review, it occurred to me, I didn't finish reading the book back then. I thought I did, but I just had so much on my plate with the Game Master Guide, the Player's Guide, then the Discovery Guide, Utopia. So I finally finished. I finally went through and made sure I read the book. So now I'm ready to give it a review. Uh, now, again, this is the campaign guide. So it's the sandbox setting that you could use the original setting to host your games in or as always, take any element you like, use it for your own game, whether it is in the Shackleton Expanse or not. There's always advice in the book of how you can incorporate these things into different areas, into different timelines. Uh, all of it's open, all of it's free because it's a role-playing game. That's what it's for. One really good thing, though, is that uh, the Shackleton Expanse, it... It is an area of space just beyond the edge of the Federation and the Klingon borders on the opposite side in the Beta Quadrant and even um, neighboring with the Romulans too. So it's just past all the stuff we really know in the Beta Quadrant. And it features Narendra Station, Starbase 364, uh, which was the first Klingon Federation cooperative Starbase. And because of that, this book too, it has a focus on both 
Federation perspective and the Klingon perspective. So if you're running a Klingon game, if you're running a Federation game, it's giving you all the information you need instantly right there without you having to think of how to adapt it. So that's one of the great things. Uh, chapter one is just the introduction, explaining what the setting is, roughly what I said, but with a lot more detail and better language. Uh, so I'm going to jump ahead to chapter two. Chapter two is the history of the expanse. So it goes in um, talking about what the Federation or what we know about the expanse uh, and also Starbase 364, Narendra Station, uh, some of this stuff has come from the Beta Quadrant source book uh, for Star Trek Adventures. So some of it, a little bit of it, is a repeat, and some of the graphics do a repeat. One thing I really like, of course, is the cross-section of um, the station, of Narendra Station. I love the cross-sections. I love all the master display things, especially for a space station. You get to see where all the different areas are, where all the different um, mechanical bits are. Uh, it, it's just always fun for me to see on the layouts, just like you can see behind me of our own ship from our game Next Frontier. This is the USS DeGrasse Tyson. I love these master displays. I love the cross sections and we get it here. I believe it's also in the Beta Quadrant source book, but this is truly its home. Uh, what... Also, oh yeah, in this chapter also, it has the worlds that you'll find in the Expanse. And what I like is it describes each of the planets that are play a big part. Much of the Expanse has never been explored, hasn't been discovered. So it does have a page reference for when you're going through the campaign, because this is a campaign guide. So there is a large story in this book too. But as you're going through a campaign, it tells you when this planet debuts or how this planet relates to the story as it goes in with the page number. So you could jump to it to read all the details that you need, but it's right there in the beginning too for easy reference. Another really good thing though, is the uh, spatial phenomenon. It talks about all the weird things that you'll find in the Expanse because uh, the Shackleton Expanse is sort of a tumultuous area of space with a lot of subspace disturbances and uh, anomalies that are going to make even regular navigation through this region a lot more tricky, a lot more perilous, and a lot more adventurous than in say, the regular Federation space in the Alpha Quadrant, Beta Quadrant. So it gives you details on that, plus uh, advice on using traits, advantages, complications, which come up with these spatial phenomena. So it's it's a very useful um, opening, not really opening, but it's really useful opening chapter for the meat of this book. Now, one thing I, I should point out right now, <clears throat> I should have actually pointed out a lot earlier, as this is a campaign book, it's a campaign guide, this book is really meant for game masters only. Uh, as a player, there are some things you could get out of it, and there are player options that you can add later, but truly the majority of the book, almost the entirety of the book, should not be read by the players it should not be looked at by the players um if you don't want to spoil what's in there if you don't want to give away uh, what you're going to discover if you go through the campaign or if your game master just uses the elements like these planets and these phenomena so honestly if you're not planning on gming it uh it's not going to be a good idea to read through this book unless you know your GM is also not going to ever use any of the material. So that might be a little bit of a negative for it, but on its own as a book, it's really good. It's chock full of information. It's really helpful for GMs, especially that's who it's designed for. You'll get a lot out of it. So let's go now to chapter three and chapter three uh, now talks about the factions in the Expanse, and includes the Federation, the Klingons, the Romulans, because they are the polities that border the Expanse. So you get a lot of information, detail about those entities 
who are immediately connected to this region of space, as well as others such as the Orions. The Orion pirates, they have their own, the syndicate, I should say, they have their own presence in there. And there's a lot of other random groups and new and old that are to be found in the expanse. So this goes through them uh, one by one and gives you a lot of good write-ups. Now, uh, I think... Um, I think I'm going to have to give a red alert. Yeah, a red alert for the new races. Because this story, the Shackleton Expanse, it's beyond Federation space. So all the planets, the people, the civilizations you're discovering, they're all new. There are, how many? Four? I think one, two, three. Yeah, there's four new races that are um, more closely tied into the campaign. So, of course, when you're going through, when you're GMing it, you can make as many new races as you want. But as far as the story of the campaign is concerned, there are four new races that are um, introduced here. Now, this is already red alert, but I'm going to pop in with a yellow alert on top of this. One thing I love is it gives a pronunciation guide for these new races because, you know, just seeing it in text probably everybody that's reading it might have a different take on how you would pronounce it because it's an alien name. So unlike other races that we know in Star Trek where it's on screen, we hear people saying it, for a new race, a new planet that's introduced in, in a book, you really have to guess what you think the pronunciation is, but the book takes the guesswork away from you. So there is pronunciation guides for uh, all of these races, and I believe the planets too, where where applicable. So back to our red alert: the new races, four races, the Akeru. Uh, again, going by the pronunciation guide. Uh, the next is the Kalmiran, uh, which is pretty interesting. They, I I found them to be a very interesting. They're they're non-humanoid. It's a water-based, uh, almost crystalline entity. And they, they have some very unique talents. There's a lot of talents pertaining to these new aliens that pop up through the book. So again, anyone that's really interested in maximizing the available talents you have for character creation, there's a lot of really interesting things in here pertaining to these new races. Um, number three is the Kofuari. I think Kofuari, I believe, is the pronunciation of it. Starts with a Q, um, not followed by a U. So hey, you, you gotta um, look for the pronunciation guide. These are these are pretty cool too. They're like four-legged, almost like um, sea otters, um, sea otter like sailing ship pirates, like the Age of Sail. Uh, but they're they are wildly imaginative and have genius level intelligence that they are basically a warp species uh, but they they choose to live in a more antiquated lifestyle and adventurous lifestyle it was really cool and the last one the vinchari vinchari so there's four races i'm not going to go into detail about all of them and that's another thing about um this review that is hard. Again, I said it's a GM only book, so it might not be for everyone. But the other thing, it's a campaign guide. It's a campaign guide. So I don't want to spoil um, a lot of what's going to be revealed as the story goes along. Uh, so I want to touch on everything, but I don't want to give detail that is going to ruin it for players who might be watching this, um, not heeding my warning, or even GMs who want to be excited and discover what's inside um, the whole campaign. So four new races, it's very cool. Um, that's definitely a red alert. Chapter four, let's go into chapter four now. Chapter four is the part that will apply to players. This is the new life path options for creating your player characters for your PCs. Now, of course, I just mentioned the four new races. You have those available. So it would be possible for you to make a character based on one of these Shackleton Expanse exclusive races, along with the really unique and interesting talents that they come with. So that's an option. And there's a fifth option now, um, which I don't believe was in any other book. I believe it was lightly touched on in the Beta Quadrant book. 
but you now have a full life path option for creating an Orion. So you could have Orion characters. Beta Quadrant, I think it just had, uh, if you're playing as Orion, it has these kind of stats and it has this. But this is the actual official full-fledged one sheet for creating your Orion character. Uh, chapter 4 also has the new gear and new technology uh, that pops up in the story and it's found in this region of space. I'm not going to go into detail of what they all are because, again, spoilers. Uh, some of it's pretty interesting. Personally, I'm not a big fan of all the minutia of gear technology. And I don't really focus too much on that because I really like the narrative. I like the story. So I really don't look at at this information quite as closely as the players in my game might because they're the ones that are interested in it and if they are interested in a piece of technology then i will look it up uh, otherwise i just skim through it i take a look uh, but it's not really a big thing for me i'm focused more on the narrative and most equipment that it really just enhances the the traits so the um, complications or the advantages so it's pretty easy for me to think of how it will be used anyhow without reading too deep into it okay sidebar done chapter five let's go we're halfway there uh living on a prayer so chapter five now this chapter this is pretty much where the huge spoilers begin uh and if you don't want anything if you don't want anything spoiled um you should turn off the video right now no wait don't do that um because nobody watches the video then anyhow just mute me mute me and then when it looks like i'm getting done with everything and i'm wrapping things up come back let's hear what we have to say uh so chapter five is the tilikal the tilikal are it's a race a powerful race that is at the center of the shackleton expanse campaign and this chapter is going to go into um, the meat behind who they are or who they were and where the civilization has come from, the kind of people they are, what they have created. Uh, and one interesting point is, uh, and I'll give it a yellow alert. It's not in my notes, but I'll give it a yellow alert. It has a lot of really cool uh, and of course, not official, but just for the sake of the story, it has canon connections with episodes of Star Trek from Next Generation, I believe Deep Space Nine. It, it gives details. Uh, in this episode, you saw this, and that is connected to the Tilikal. Like a lot of the mysterious things that have popped up in episodes throughout the history of Star Trek, where it's from ancient race or lost race, they all know where this stuff came from. They connect a lot of that. There's a sidebar here where they connect it with um, the the canon. The Tilikal is behind a lot of this. So I thought that was really fascinating. I thought that was really cool. Um, and again, no spoilers. No spoilers. I don't want to ruin anything. Um, even, uh, even something minor like that that maybe not directly related, but... It's good inspiration for if you want to keep making these connections, even if you're not running the campaign, uh, it works out great. Uh, so you'll get your information on the history of the world, um, their own history, their technology, and just who they were as a people. Now the biggest spoilers, the biggest spoilers, which I'm not going to spoil, chapter six, uh, and I'll give that a red alert. This is it. This is what the book is about. This is the uh, campaign. And if you played Star Trek Adventures when it was first released, 2016, 2017-ish, uh, you know when they started, they had a living campaign where they released free missions, free adventures online. Uh, groups would play it, give their feedback about how the mission ended up, to Modiphius and Modiphius would use maybe the consensus of how those missions turned out to create the next chapter in the story. So basically the more you played as a group and you gave your, your feedback to Modiphius, you were designing or helping design and shape where the story was going. They weren't able, unfortunately, because of just 
the logistics. Modiphius wasn't able to keep up with the living campaign and they had to bring it to a close. The living campaign is here. It's been taken, reworked, updated, and created into uh, this 10 part campaign. So 10 part, it's 10 adventures. So much like what you would get in the book, like uh, Strange New Worlds or These Are the Voyages, you have that all contained in the middle of this book. This is the big campaign. Uh, and it goes even beyond these 10 missions, which I will get to um, uh, in a second. But uh, what, what do I want to focus on first? Because there's a lot of information here. I'm just scanning at my notes. Um, of course, very basically, a lot of GM support for running this game, uh, a lot of um, detail of how you can incorporate it into your own game, uh, even if you're not going to dive directly into Shackleton Expanse. Uh, this book is really designed to help GMs at any level uh, carry through with the information you'll find here. But, uh, as I said, it's the living campaign pulled together, it's revamped, going through it takes place over a period of a hundred years and again some spoilers here slight spoilers the first adventures take place in the original series era and then it continues and finishes in the next generation era which i think is really cool and then it gives you as a gm a lot of options of how are you going to do this are you going to do a flashback are you going to create a past cast are you going to create a future cast are you going to have the past crew time travel into the future are you going to just say no it wasn't 100 years ago or it wasn't 100 years from now we're just going to squeeze it all into this time but the basic default is this story stretches it begins 100 years ago and then the whole exciting climax comes to a head in the TNG era. So I thought that was clever how they they stretched it out. And it gives you as a GM a lot of choices of how you are going to work with this material. Uh, it also, as I mentioned before, since this is a combined Klingon and Federation area, it also gives advice on how to run these adventures from a Klingon perspective. The default is Federation. Starfleet, but it also gives advice if you're running this as a Klingon, your priorities for each mission are probably going to be a bit different than what Starfleet's doing. So it gives information on how to do that. Uh, and I want to say again, as everything is spoilers, that includes the pictures you will find in these chapters. So players or anyone who doesn't want to be spoiled, don't flip through the middle of this book trying to look at the artwork, which is gorgeous, because there are spoiler pictures for things that happen inside these adventures. Not a lot, but you kind of get the gist, or you'll see characters, you'll see situations that maybe will give away what's going to happen in the story. So I recommend against that. Um, as always, I hate being spoiled and I hate spoiling things for other people. So just a warning, heads up, don't flip through the book. Don't flip just to look at pictures because that could be dangerous. Okay, so that is chapter six. Bye-bye, red alert. Chapter seven is, um, oh, this is a chapter about exploring the expanse. And this is, again, a GM advice chapter so after you get all the campaigns together now you get the uh information for the gms of how to best use uh all of the adventures that came in um and including how to use anything in the shackleton expanse or just the tilakal themselves without the campaign how can you incorporate this into your own games into your own stories uh so it's a really good um piece of advice it's a really good chapter I should say, for advice uh, if you're not interested in running the campaign, but you do like the setting and you do like the concepts, this chapter is going to give you a lot of the information you'll work with. This also has the mission briefs, and that's what I alluded to earlier. Previous chapter, 10-part story, but I believe there are close to 40 mission briefs. Uh, you may know mission briefs are short one sheet um, briefs 
hence the name, uh, brief descriptions, outlines of an adventure. It's not a full adventure. It just gives you the key components of story that you could then work into your own individual episodes, squeeze into different adventures, or flesh it out on your own and make it its own adventure, its own episode. So I think there are, if I counted right, there are 11 mission briefs taking place back in the TOS era in 2269. And there are, I think, 26 mission briefs in uh, the TNG era, which is 2371. So with 10 giant adventures and then nearly 40 mission briefs, you could potentially run your entire Star Trek adventure series as this campaign, because of course the mission briefs all connect. It's all supporting things. You could run multiple seasons of your series as nothing but a Shackleton Expanse Tilakal Saga series. That's really exciting, especially if you go by Modern Trek 10 episode seasons. You have at least five seasons worth of material there. That is amazing. You have an entire Star Trek series of your own creation in this one single book. I, I can't even express how exciting that is from a Game Master perspective, especially if you are the kind of Game Master who loves running pre-made adventures or adapting pre-made adventures into your own episodes. This book is so for you. So please consider it. And again, you could just take bits and pieces to use as you like. Uh, let me go chapter eight now. We're almost at the end already. Look at that. Chapter eight is um, allies and adversaries. Uh, the usual thing you find in the source book. So you'll have... Uh, all the NPCs that pertain to the area and the story, the campaign, including all the staff, the higher-ups and the staff, the people you'll encounter on the Ranger Station, the core setting for Shackleton Expanse. You'll have um, characters from the Adventures, of course, uh, the adversaries, the NPC adversaries for the new species, like you'll find in the core rule books and the other source books where you'll have like Orion Engineer or whatever. It'll have those kind of characters that you could quickly pull for stats for all of the four new species introduced into this book. And um, Tilakal characters too. Not saying any more about what you're going to find there. Spoilers. And beasts, of course, they have the bestiary. So any kind of monsters or creatures that pop up in this region of space, you can now use for your games and reference them there. Chapter 9, here we go. Chapter 9 is the Starships and Vessels chapter. So uh, unsurprisingly, um, the starships that um, feature heavily in the campaign, the alien ships, the NPC ships. And the campaign was kind of designed uh, when... It, was debuted as the living campaign so this campaign was designed with three potential federation ships that your characters would serve on uh and these are actually um canon ships from star trek uh, i say three but even in the 2269 tos period they also had the uss lexington which we all know from the original series itself we've seen that there we don't know what happened after what what was it m5 computer incident your characters could potentially serve on that ship uh as for the next generation you had the uss venture was that right the venture uh the bellerophon and the thunder child uh, so Galaxy class, uh, Intrepid class, and the um, Akira class, which I love so much. Uh, those were all canon. They all appeared on screen. Um, Deep Space Nine, Next Generation, First Contact. Uh, so they have been there. Uh, they have been there before. Uh, so you could use the ships if you want to take place on the ships that were designed to be in this campaign. But... Of course, it's a role-playing game. You're free to do what you want. Your own ship, your own hero ship is fine too. But you get the stats for those um, pre-made ships that were built into the campaign uh, in this chapter. So that brings us to our final chapter, chapter 10. And I'm going to give this a yellow alert. 
Uh, I'm going to give yellow alert to chapter 10. Uh, this is going to appeal to a lot of people who love random tables. And what this chapter is, it's full of random tables for creating your own star system, your own stars, your own solar system, um, specifically tailored to be in the Shackleton Expanse. But you could use this easily for anywhere, anywhere in the galaxy. So it's just chock full of tables that if you want off the top of your head to make a new system for your players to explore or discover, you could just make a quick few rolls and bam, you got your own original star system out there. Uh, so I, I thought it was pretty interesting. The chapter is called Stellar Cartography. Uh, I'm not really one for random tables, but I do like them from time to time uh, just to shake things up because sometimes my imagination always heads in the same direction. So to give something new, uh, random tables are fun. And I know a lot of people love random tables. So creating your own sector, original sector, star system, this is the chapter for you. And that's it. That is the 10 chapters of the Shackleton Expanse. Uh, this book, as I said, the downside is it's really not for players. So this is probably the only book uh, in the STA line that I can't recommend to everyone. I think it would be lovely if everyone bought it. I think it would be lovely if every player tried their hand at GMing. Pick up the Game Master Guide, read the advice, give it a shot. It's not as hard as you may think. Uh, it's not as boring as some people think. Dear Lord, it is the most fun I have role playing. Uh, give it a shot. And if you do, that gives you access to this book. But again, downside, if you're not going to GM it, I would not recommend looking through it. Uh, and I would not recommend touching it except for what your GM shows you. Look at this page, look at this page, look at this page. Don't wander beyond that. So unfortunately, that is a pretty heavy downside. Otherwise, the upsides are astronomical. Original setting. Uh, let, me get, let me get out of this tiny box. What am I doing down here? Original setting, uh, strictly for Star Trek Adventures. Original aliens, original planets. Everything is new while still being close enough to the Federation. You don't have to be thrown to the far side of the Delta Quadrant. You can still explore something never seen before. And you get this adventure that is epic. Literally, this is an epic epic galaxy shaking adventure if you like pre-made stories pre-made campaigns you'll find no fault with this book that's it shackleton expanse i do recommend it but with that huge caveat that it's not going to be for players for the most part um, but if you this applies to you if you're a gm or you're just not interested in running the campaign or playing in the campaign i do recommend picking it up it's full of so much you could use in the game as a player as a gm uh, so give it a shot give it a read um, pick it up modifius has not been slipping up yet and more amazing things are on the horizon and fingers crossed i'm going to be able to review one of them in um just a couple of months so there we go thank you for watching uh as usual we want to hear from you any comment any question any story share your stories with us star trek adventures or otherwise any star trek story uh, i just love talking with fellow trekkies uh i don't i'm not surrounded by trekkies in japan you know i i depend on you and for those of you who have reached out who do interact with us uh i appreciate you very much but thank you for watching thank you for being here um i hope this was helpful for you and i hope to see you in the future which i won't because i see nobody i keep saying that it makes no sense but thank you very much uh and thanks for watching see you next time live long and prosper Peace and long life, my friends. Take it easy.